Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. I am excited to see this room so filled. Rarely do we have standing room only, um, what do we call this, the fire marshal squad type of, of uh, crowd. I won't call the fire marshal if you don't. Um, so kind of squeeze in, sit on the um, stairs if you want. They're nice and clean. It's the beginning of the school year. Um, for those of you... For those of you who don't know me or, or who don't recognize me without the beard, I'm Michael Scharf. I'm the co-dean of the law school. It is my great pleasure to welcome you not only to the Klatsky lecture, but the first lecture of our new school year. And you are in for a real treat today. Let me start by telling you a little bit about the history of the Klatsky Lecture and then introducing our wonderful speaker today. Um, the Klatsky Lecture was established 17 years ago by one of the university's trustees, Bruce Klatsky, who is a renowned human rights figure in his own right. He ran a company that was worldwide and was one of the first to be a human rights oriented corporation. At our school, he has endowed this lecture, and the lecture over the years has featured some of the most prominent people in the world of international criminal law and human rights that you can imagine, and they've all come through our doorsteps here in Cleveland. He's also endowed two permanent spots for our students every year at Human Rights Watch, and those students who have done that have launched into wonderful careers in the United Nations and in the human rights sphere. This is all part of our greater international law program, which is currently ranked 14th best in the United States. And we are very proud of our program. We had our 25th anniversary a couple of years ago. The program is endowed, and with most of the money in our endowment, we send our students off during the summers and during the fall and spring to work at international institutions. And many of our students have entered the field that way. I know there are many of you in the audience that are thinking about going that route, and I'm sure that today's remarks will inspire you as well. Let me tell you now about our speaker today. Um, Catherine Marquis Uhel is a French judge, uh, and she's a wonderfully interesting person. Um, on, in her spare time, she hang glides and has uh, a little dog named Ginger, but she has had a really outstanding career in international law. Um, it began with being a judge, and then she worked at the Yugoslavia Tribunal as a legal advisor to the judges, and then she worked as an investigative judge at the Cambodia Tribunal. Then she was the ombudsperson for the UN Security Council Terrorism Sanctions Committee. And that is the committee that enforces the freezing of assets on people associated with Al-Qaeda around the world. And if they get the wrong person in a worldwide asset freeze, it goes to the special mechanism that she was in charge of. And while she was there, she heard that they were going to be creating an investigation for Syria. And Syria has, as all of you who read the newspapers know, become the number one crisis in the world for the last several years, since 2011. There have been several million refugees which have created their own challenges, but also challenges to the countries where they have gone, including in Europe and in the United States. There have been thousands of people who have been tortured and murdered and subject to the use of chemical weapons, and the atrocities are so large in scale that they absolutely cry out for some international response. But as you all know, most of the international tribunals and most of the, the major actions in the world come through the UN Security Council. And in the Security Council, the, the five permanent members have a veto, and Russia has been very close with the Assad regime and has vetoed 12 resolutions involving Syria, including resolutions that would have created an investigation. So 
an old friend who's spoken at this law school, Christian Van Avaser, uh, who is an ambassador from Liechtenstein and several others, had the idea of going to the General Assembly of the United Nations and seeing if they could create an international investigation. Never before done, and we're going to hear during the speech some of the political and legal challenges that that has resulted in. But it, it did happen. They created the investigation. The Secretary General appointed uh, the judge, and she took office about a year ago. Um, we here at this school have a war crimes research office that Jim Johnson, who was the adjunct faculty member of the year this year, runs. And um, his office has done work for international tribunals and piracy courts and has even done some work for this investigation. We hope more in the future as well. Um, it is a privilege for our law school to be involved in this very important work. And we are very excited to hear what you have to say. Before you do, though, it is my great, great honor to present you with the award that we give once a year. It is sometimes referred to as Cleveland's Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> it is the Cox Center Humanitarian of the Year Award. And this year, it goes to Judge Marky Ewell. The judge will speak for about 30 minutes, and then she will answer your questions. We do have a handheld microphone, and we have the room till 1 o'clock. So we will enjoy, and thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you for having me. Dear Dean Scharf, um, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I'm very honored to accept the Frederick, Frederick Cox uh, Award for Advancing Global Justice and to be here with you today to deliver the Klesky and Human Rights Lecture. Today, no situation can highlight the need and urgency to advance global justice more than the situation in, in Syria. Since the beginning of the crisis, Countless reports of atrocities committed on all sides have been brought to the attention of the, com of the international community involving widespread violations of human rights and international humanitarian law. Depending on the circumstances, these violations may um, amount to core international crimes. They involve torture and forced disappearances, extrajudicial killings, sexual violence against male and females, including sexual slavery, attacks against civilians and civilian objects, including schools, medical facilities and personnel, and the use of chemical weapons. The horrors suffered by the Syrian people over the past seven years defy description, and so far the affected communities have been understandably disillusioned sorry, by the prospect of seeing justice. Since the outbreak of violence in 2011, the Security Council has failed, as um, Dean Scharf was reminding you, to refer the situation of Syria to the International Criminal Court or to create another tribunal as it did in the past with the situations of Rwanda and, and former Yugoslavia. This is why, and this is again this background, that in December 2016, the General Assembly established the International Impartial an independent mechanism to assist in the investigation and prosecution of the, for the most serious crimes under international criminal law uh, in the Syrian Arab Republic since March 2011. I will refer it, you understand the length of the title, requires me to, to find a short title, I'll refer it to the mechanism of the AAAM as we say. But this long title already tells you a lot about some key aspects of the mechanism's mandate. This body is innovative in many ways and differs significantly from uh, previous accountability initiatives established by the United Nations, such as, for instance, the ad hoc or even fact-finding human rights uh, commission. But in fact, it also builds extensively on the experience of the ad hoc tribunals. As you know, the mechanism is not a prosecutor's office nor a court. It cannot issue indictments 
uh, prosecute cases or render judgment. Instead, it is mandated to collect, to consolidate, preserve, and analyze evidence of crimes, of these most serious crimes, and to use the, the body of materials, evidence, information collected by so many actors, including UN bodies, Syrian and international NGOs, individuals and states. The mechanism is further mandated to prepare files to facilitate and expedite uh, fair and independent criminal proceedings in accordance with international law standards in national, regional or uh, international courts of tribunal which currently have or may in the future have jurisdiction for these crimes. Currently, as you may have heard, this essentially includes national courts, particularly in Europe, and, but also elsewhere, that can exercise jurisdiction, such as forms of uh, universal jurisdiction or extended forms of uh, traditional uh, jurisdiction. However, uh, in the future, these crimes may indeed be prosecuted, and that's what we hope, at the international level or in regional courts. It's hope also that in the future, Syria, Syrian courts themselves will be in a position and willing to play their part in this accountability process. In other words, the mechanism has been mandated to conduct essential preparatory work grounded in um, criminal law methodology that will be needed for accountability purposes, regardless of which judicial avenues may emerge in the future. I believe that the creation of the mechanism is in fact uh, an important demonstration of the international community's will to ensure that crimes committed in Syria don't go unpunished. It's innovative mandate that recognizes the value of creating synergies between international human rights fact findings and criminal justice processes constitute a crucial step forward towards ensuring accountability for these crimes. In carrying out its function, the mechanism is guided by fundamental principles of independence and impartiality. What does it mean? In terms of independence, it means that we do not act on instruction from any entity in performing our work. We, we are not influenced by the agendas of external actors. And in terms of the material we collect, we are not importing the conclusions drawn by others. Rather, we actually assess the material that we collect based on uh, our own, and, and we draw our own inferences. In terms of impartiality, it means that we will not apply any bias against or in favor of any particular state, group, or individual. Instead, we will address crimes committed in Syria regardless of any affiliation of the alleged perpetrators. In discharging this mandate, the mechanism is confronted with quite a lot of challenges. To tell the truth, I will only focus on two. One of the main ones being the unprecedented volumes, fragmentation, and duplication of material. You may think that that shouldn't be a challenge. Having a large body of uh, information and evidence is actually an asset, but it brings its own challenges. This includes large amount of images and video material. We are in a world in a, at a time where everyone has, in this part of the world has a, a smartphone and is able to record violences being committed in front of them. But this indeed presents two important challenges. The first one relates to the preservation and analysis um, of such volumes of materials. To be able to do so, the mechanism has acquired a state-of-the-art evidence management system, as it was mandated in our terms of reference. And we have implemented measures uh, aimed at protecting confidential materials and work product against cyber attacks, which are clearly uh, things we need to be acutely aware of, uh, risk. Data protection and information, uh, and information security sorry, are key priorities, and the mechanism is firm in its commitment to um, uh, not compromise the safety and security of material in our possession. This includes sensitive personal data concerning the victims and the witnesses. The second challenge flowing from the availability of such uh, high volumes of materials is in fact um, th the need to um, the need to process materials which includes duplicates which includes 
um, techniques of collection which do not accord in, in a number of occasions with criminal law standards. So uh, we um, face evidentiary changes and we need to anticipate them and we need to work on techniques and methodologies that will make the most of the material that we are able to collect. In this respect, our IT systems provide a framework for uh, meticulously organizing the material, ensuring that it's easily searchable, retrievable, and at the same time um, that appropriate metadata are established, integrated, and maintained to facilitate the analysis and also uh, demonstrate the authenticity of the material that we decide to rely on. There is also a, a great deal of need for cooperation of uh, the material that we get from various entities. Methods for tracking duplicate materials, linking translation and rigorously enforcing confidentiality restrictions, including using cutting edge technology, are also being integrated in the system that we have set up. I was telling colleagues um, at uh, Chautauqua Dialogues uh, during the last couple of days that uh, I've never worked in an environment with, where IT colleagues and really cutting edge IT colleagues are uh, so much embedded in the core work uh, that we do to, to uh, contribute to accountability. That wasn't the case in the ICTY where I work many years, certainly not in Cambodia and, and definitely not at my time in my judicial system. Another key challenge for the mechanism is ensuring sustained funding uh, in creating the mechanism, the GA, uh, in fact, relied, uh, de decided that we would rely on um, uh, voluntary contribution at least for a while. However, um, this is not an appropriate way to, uh, to obtain sustainability for accountability mechanism. <clears throat> and I see um, an important step taken um, in October 2017 when the GA, in fact, uh, called upon the Secretary General to include the budget needs of the AAAM in its, uh, in its budget for 2020. We are actively working on preparing a, a budget accordingly. If this, um, and I am optimistic it will be the case, this budget is accepted, it would be a significant step forward and it would demonstrate the International Committee's genuine commitment to justice for victims of crimes in Syria. I'd like to turn now to current uh, priorities for the mechanism. We are determined to turn our evidence collection into a comprehensive central repository for the evidence that uh, concerns crime committed in Syria, a repository that can be used by the various uh, prosecuting authorities to establish cases uh, that they are investigating. This is possible given the mandate that we have, which is extremely broad and uh, dedicated focus that we have on the situation in Syria, and also our capacity uh, to access material from a wide uh, variety of uh, uh, sources. In line with this objective, the mechanism is progressing efforts to collect information and evidence from, uh, as I said, a, ver a variety of sources, including UN entities, uh, civil society, states, and other actors. I'm not going to spend uh, too much time on talking about the relationship we have with the Commission of Inquiry on Syria, but it's undeniably uh, an important partner for us, and we uh, last March signed a memorandum of understanding on the basis of which we have been able to uh, acquire a, a large proportion of their uh, data. In addition to the Commission of Inquiry on Syria, we are engaging with the other UN, uh, United Nations entities and we identify concrete means and opportunities for coordination and also, and also uh, wherever possible to acquire data that are relevant to our mandate. We are also engaging extensively with civil society, in particular Syrian NGOs, and their role, uh, as you can imagine, is extremely important, has been very important in documenting crimes. We have recognized from the very start the, the very special role that they play in this process. Since violent uh, uh, unrest erupted in March 2011, and as the country descended into armed conflict, numerous individuals and organizations have been relentlessly uh, documenting violations of human rights and international human law. 
they did so often at great risk for their own life or that of their loved ones. So treating them in a respectful and in a, in a way that shows them that they are not only sources of information but also actors in the process is extremely important. The material they've gathered is obviously um, an integral part of what we seek to access to, and in order to to process uh, further in the in the documentation in the collection effort, we've actually uh, developed and distributed to these NGOs uh, surveys uh, inquiring on the type, quantity, format, but also content of their materials, and this is extremely useful for us in order to uh, to prioritize collection effort. But we're also committed, as I said, to ensuring a two-way communication. And uh, we have uh, developed a platform that actually um, allows us to meet uh, with a number of NGOs. We, last time we met uh, uh, with 28 of them that are very active in, in the field of documentation, but also on other uh, aspects of the conflict and, and can be extremely valuable uh, sources of uh, information about the, the context. We meet um, twice a year with them, but we're also developing other modes of engagement, including one-to-one, -one, including um, uh, possibilities of giving them feedback on the type of material that they collected whenever possible. We have signed a protocol of engagement, uh, which is on our website, and I encourage you to have a look at it if you want to see what are the guiding principles of this engagement. We're also engaging uh, with states. Many of them are willing to provide um, us with relevant information. In some instances, it has required them to uh, review their existing legislation uh, to change it and to allow for such coordination, which is called upon by the General Assembly. In other situations, it has been enough to engage in developing a memorandum of understanding. We have. A I'd like to give you a little bit of a, an insight into our working methodology. We have um, identified the need for what I will refer to as a structural investigation. It's no invention on, on our part. We've actually been very inspired by what some of the national prosecutors currently do in relation to Syria. In a nutshell, the structural investigation seeks to map crime patterns. Uh, it examines the contextual elements required to establish core crime, the chapeau requirement, if you wish. It also seeks to apprehend the cultural, historical, and gender dimension of the crimes, as well as the structures of power, the police, the military, and other um, structures of power taking part in the commission of crimes. And um, we are seeking to obviously uh, establish links between the crimes and the individuals, ranging from uh, direct physical perpetrators uh, to other perpetrators wielding power and authority over the events. A classic methodology, you would, you would say, when, when one knows what uh, establishing uh, international crimes requires, but um, a methodology that also builds on uh, the lesson learned by the tribunals. Uh, if, you, if you start your collection effort and also your case building using such a structural investigation, you're a really better place to make progress. The volume of allegation and the number of potential perpetrators will, you will understand, easily make it impossible for the mechanism to address all the crimes committed in Syria since March 2011. So the structural investigation, in fact, provides a pr principal foundation uh, for us to exercise our discretion in selecting cases in an impartial and independent way. It also promotes consistency of approach across uh, the mechanism's case file, given the fact that factual, key factual issues will be used in various cases, in several cases. And the cases will, the, the, the cross cutting material or analysis, if you wish, uh, concerns, for instance, the existence or the nature of armed conflicts, um, the widespread or systematic nature of attacks, uh, for, which, as you know, is key. Both are key to establish war crimes or crime against humanity, but also command structures, joint action resulting in the commission of crimes, which are key for establishing uh, or, or retaining certain th theories of responsibility, such as superior responsibility or co 
So when it comes to selection of specific case file, we are guided by the principle outlined in uh, our first report to the General Assembly, which was rendered uh, in March of this year. And um, based on the result of the structural investigation, we are uh, using a number of uh, factors to select which cases to, to build. Um, these uh, factors include the gravity of crimes, obviously, but that's certainly not uh, sufficient given the nature of the crime we are dealing with, uh, the level of the alleged perpetrator, uh, the crime categories emblematic of events in the Syrian Arab Republic, trying to achieve a fair representation of crimes committed against all vi victims uh, and on all sides of the events but also a fair representation of the specific harms experienced by men, women, girls, and boys, and uh, crime categories and culpable acts that, uh, in fact, sustain the ongoing commission of crimes. We're also having a close look at cl complementarity issues, and notably what are the case files that are currently developed by various national prosecutors. Finally, a key priority for us is supporting national jurisdiction efforts to investigate and prosecute crimes in Syria. To this end, we have um, proactive engagement with national war crimes units in various states, including um, both directly, sorry, and uh, as part of uh, the European uh, Genocide Network, which is um, hosted by Eurojust in The Hague, and which uh, assembles a representative of the various war crimes units, not only in Europe, but also uh, elsewhere in the world. Consultation have, have been uh, held with those uh, actors to identify areas where we can be of assistance to overcome some of the main challenges that they face in their work. And this include limited resources. Even those which are well equipped are actually, in fact, dealing with many more situations than the Syrian situation, so they are indeed uh, resource limitation, lack of access to the territory, which we face as well, but we have means to uh, overcome that, and um, the constraints which derive from their own systems of procedural rules. So we see really a unique opportunity for us, given our status, to be um, actively engaged in supporting the efforts. We can rely for that on an important analytical um, capacity within the mechanism, but also an important Arabic-speaking component, which often the war crimes units don't have. And our mandate deriving from GA uh, resolution also places it relatively well to be able to access the material that others possess, and therefore, as I said, uh, offer that as a repository for prosecutors. To date, we have received and we are currently pro processing several requests for information and evidence from national prosecutors. Uh, these requests are also informing our collection effort. So we, we include in the collection plan that we build those needs. And wherever it's possible, we're actually giving priorities to those efforts of uh, collection that could assist prosecutors. While our mandate is firmly centered on supporting criminal prosecution, we're also recognizing that our broader dimension, transitional justice dimensions, I will give you one, only one example, but you, you can read in our reports um, more, more on that. Um, the situation of missing, which is clearly something victims uh, care uh, immensely about, is something that we can integrate in our working methods. Um, this is again experience from the ad hocs. When you, uh, from the outset, decide to tag the material that you, you receive that contains valuable information about such processes, well, it's easily retrievable and you can support um, processes that seek to inform the families about the fate of their, their loved ones. That's a simple but extremely useful way of doing it. And if you can do it timely, as opposed to at the end, of your uh, work as a mechanism and as a legacy, you can see the difference. I'd like to spend a few words before concluding on the meaning of justice and the significance of the mechanism work for those most affected by the crimes in Syria. Justice has no meaning unless accountability efforts are not driven by the demands uh, of victims. This is why in performing our work, we are guided by victim-centered approach and we are making efforts to translate that 
wish, that goal, into a meaningful and specific aspect of our work. The mechanism is also committed to promoting outreach and effective exchanges with affected communities, as well as hearing the views and interests of victims and making sure that they, they are actually canvassed and considered on an ongoing basis in our work. We're mindful as well, based on experience from the past, of the risk of marginalizing the experiences of certain categories of victims in international justice processes. I'm thinking in particular of victims of sexual and gender-based violence. It's not by chance that special emphasis has been placed on these crimes in our terms of reference. We've learned from the 25 last years of uh, international criminal justice that if this is not really embedded and taken seriously into the work of uh, accountability mechanism, we are missing uh, these issues and they are diluted, disappearing from the core work. So from the early days of uh, our work, uh, we have actually appointed experts in sexual and gender-based violence in our team, not as focal points, but really as investigators, um, analysts, lawyers, uh, so that the teams are working and taking those issues seriously into consideration. We are committed to addressing the full range of sexual violence and gender-based crimes arising in the Syrian <coughs> context to make sure that they form part of our core work uh, to support accountability and that the voices of women in particular are properly heard in the accountability process. If you go back to the records of the ad hoc tribunals, you will see that the number of female victims that have actually been interviewed is very limited compared to that of men, and there are many reasons for that. I can't enter into details here, but again, uh, an intended and deliberate approach to overcome those difficulties is key if you want to, uh, to properly address those crimes. Let me conclude by a, a short reflection on the theme of the award that I'm honored to receive today, Advancing Global Justice. In establishing the mechanism, the first body of this kind ever established, and in calling upon states, all parties to the conflict, as well as civil society to cooperate fully with it, the General Assembly has taken an initiative that I see as an historical, uh, historic step sorry, towards accountability. Our creation sends a signal that impunity for those responsible for the most heinous crimes committed in Syria is not acceptable. It also signals that the pursuit of uh, accountability no longer requires a choice between um, national and international or hybrid jurisdiction. On the contrary, the mechanism can be seen as a model integrating different jurisdictional avenues at the national, regional, and international level. It also constitutes a model for bridging the gap between uh, human rights fact-finding and criminal prosecution through proactive cooperation between investigative and prosecuting authorities, UN entities, and civil society. I'm mindful of the disillusionment, definitely I can't pronounce this name, sorry, of people most affected by these crimes, those who have no uh, immediate prospect of justice. The mechanism which was established, again, a background of daunting allegations of international crime and flagrant impunity is globally raising important hopes and expectation, not least on the part of the Syrian victims and the civil, civilian population at LAC. We have to be realistic. Uh, lots of work and time is going to be required before the mechanism is in a position to complete and share full-fledged uh, files. In addition, today we can't anticipate where, whether and when an international court or tribunal may in the future have jurisdiction over those crimes. However, several criminal proceedings relating to Syria have been initiated in various countries. In relation to these, the mechanism can play an immediate and significant role in supporting ongoing and future investigation of crimes committed in Syria. I believe that the mechanism has a potential to contribute meaningfully to ensuring accountability and providing um, redress for victims by assisting national prosecutions and investigations. At the same time, we are doing this preparatory work that is needed to pave the way for future prosecution also at the international level. 
I am inspired by the dignity and I draw strength from the courage of the Syrian people as I carry out the important task that has been entrusted to me as head of the mechanism. Thank you for your attention. And of course, I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Reports are that the Syrian government is on the verge of taking the one remaining rebel stronghold in the country, thereby essentially ending the civil war uh, with their victory. Uh, uh, my understanding is that the UN and, and agencies work with the consent of the member states. And what, in, what incentive would the Syrian government or the Syrian court systems have to cooperate with you, especially after they've been after they've been victorious in a seven-year civil war, and what role would the Russians and the Iranians play in trying to block any efforts that you might try to affect? Okay. Shall we? Shall I answer each question? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Well, I would say which incentive? Uh, probably not many incentives at this very moment, but as I said. Um, we are determined to turn to every single possible source uh, of information and to uh, undertake our mandate in an impartial and independent way, which it means in the current context that even if, for instance, the Syrian uh, Arab Republic doesn't respond to our request, we continue to deliberately try to meet the representative and to send requests. And we will continue to do that. Um, same with other states that are not necessarily supportive of the mechanism who are not necessarily recognizing the legitimacy of its establishment by the, by the General Assembly. Being impartial means, as I said, uh, not uh, turning your attention to only one side of the conflict, but having this uh, uh, approach. Now, there is a reality. Um, uh, you may face a situation where certain crimes are, are less documented because you are confronted with refusal of uh, uh, cooperation. That has been the reality since international criminal justice exists. But that doesn't mean that you are prevented from moving forward. You may have to uh, exercise more efforts. You may have to find ways to also build a trust with uh, some of the victims that may at some stage be discouraged of seeing that the crime they were victims of uh, um, are not actually addressed properly uh, because uh, the authorities who have the responsibility to investigate those crimes are not doing their work. I'm not saying it's easy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming here today. Uh, my question is, Accountability and justice are uh, uh, two of the, the legal, um, international legal community most foremost objectives. You know, in your case, um, um, in the Syria case, and in your role as, as a lead investigator, you know, um, do you think these two objectives will be met in the next five years or, say, or, or so? You know, and if so, um, how can the international community be able to strike an agreement, especially in the um, UN Security Council, which is divided, as you eloquently mentioned, about um, Russia blocking um, resolutions? So um, in your role as lead investigator, do you think we, the international community can achieve this objective in the next couple of years? Because the people of Syria... Yes, they are brave. Yes, they are resilient. But I think it's high time the international community helped them to get back to their, to their um, noble land. <coughs> well, 
Well, you're, you're absolutely right. These are really key aspects of our modern forms of uh, international criminal justice. We need to uh, work towards those objectives, but we also need to be realistic in um, establishing the mechanism. There was a recognition of the blockages, and it's because there are blockages that it's so important to make sure that the evidence doesn't disappear, that the analysis is made, and that the day uh, international uh, judicial avenues become available, work as uh, time has not been lost. So we have example of the past. I served as a judge in the uh, extraordinary chambers in the court of Cambodia, also known as the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. We were dealing with crimes committed 30 years before. That is not ideal. <laughs> I, I concede, and I certainly don't wish something of that kind for the situation in Syria. And that's why every single opportunity of justice provided that uh, fair trial rights are respected and that no, def no death penalty applies are actually um, used. Uh, and that's why this mechanism is not just meant to build cases for the future, but also support those avenues. How long will it take? I don't know. What I know is that um, a peace where justice is absent is no peace, and it doesn't last. That's my experience. So I'm confident, but I can't say when. Competition. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you for being here. You mentioned that many more male victims had been interviewed than female victims. I was wondering if you would be willing to like enumerate some of your thoughts on why that is and like how we can help this situation. There are many reasons, but some of the reasons that come to mind have to um, deal with the nature of the conflict and the fact that often male male uh, victims were or, or witnesses were e more easily available. Um, you also have to deal with um, the mindset of the investigators. I think this has changed as well. We learned a lot during the past 25 years in terms of uh, having proactive strategies to, um, uh, to want to hear from wi female as well. I'll give you an example uh, with that citing to any particular source, but you hear that certain actors involved on the ground, for instance, leave the country and, and go elsewhere and become available for, uh, for interviews. One could say, okay, we're going to, if, if we're talking about people uh, who are essentially male, uh, people that were on the ground, one could say, okay, we're going to talk to those. We're going to uh, identify those uh, actors uh, who have something to say. You could also think of what about the family that are living in the country and are with them now? Do they have something to say? Do the female that may have observed other aspects of the situation have something to say? Did they experience harms? You, you see, it's, it's a mindset. And I'm not saying that uh, any of the past attitudes which have led to more uh, men than women being uh, interviewed and, and uh, being in a position to recount their to give their account of what happened uh, during a situation was uh, ill-intended, certainly not, but it was just, um, it was just um, a product of uh, also uh, the fact that probably even less women were embedded in the investigative teams or in the lawyer's team, in the analyst team. I think that requires an intent to deal with this issue. And that's why we, uh, our mandate actually recognizes the, that need. The same when you, when you talk about sexual violence and limited to sexual violence, yeah, there are many other gender aspects uh, to, uh, uh, to take into account when, when building an investigation. And that's exactly the attitude that we have, trying to uh, uh, build on the lessons learned and uh, develop a methodology that will enable us better to reflect those. Uh, dimensions. Great. Uh, thanks again for coming here. My name is Tim Webster and I teach international human rights law, so I'm really excited you're here and um, excited to see my students here as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, and uh, apropos of the of the previous question, uh, in my in my night job, I do research on World War II litigation in East Asia. So there's still 75 years after the fact, lots of ongoing disputes about who's accountable for what from a war that none of us was around for. Um, and and part of that um, shows that uh, one other accountability mechanism is uh, obviously there's criminal tribunals or international you know hybrid tribunals. Um, but I'd also like to hear your thoughts about civil litigation, right? So all you know, there's been hundreds of cases about um, World War II brought in uh, in Asian courts and American courts and so forth. Um, you mentioned that there is the possibility that your mechanism would share evidence with criminal prosecutors. But I'm wondering if there's any um, hope or uh, any indication that if someone brought a civil lawsuit, um, as as has taken place in this country through the Alien Tort Statute against um, Serbian war crimes and others, um, whether civil litigation would also be, um, or, or uh, you know, plaintiffs in civil litigation would also be able to reach out to your mechanism and, uh, and gain evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's clear that the, the mandate seem, seems to me to be really focused on uh, criminal uh, accountability, at least as a, as a priority. We, we don't have, we, we have not reached at this stage, I must be totally open and frank with you, a definite answer to that. But we are, for instance, I will give you another example of where and how we actually look at those issues. Um, we, we have um, civil society actors that are building cases, right? And they are um, having their own work and they are interested in uh, seeing how the mechanism could uh, could actually support their efforts. So at the moment, we read our terms of reference as li limiting our support to the courts or to the prosecutors uh, in the criminal law uh, system. Actually, the mandate doesn't say uh, prosecutor, it says courts. So hence your, <laughs> your valid question. But w what we understand as a limitation of the mandate would be, for instance, to provide uh, evidence directly to uh, an NGO what we can see we can do is, for instance, to if they accept to share the content of their files, uh, is to identify what we can add to that for an ongoing prosecution, for instance, and provide it directly to the court in question if the limitation that I mentioned earlier are, uh, are respected, like human rights, uh, no death penalty. So, I don't know what we will answer to your question, but these are part of questions that we are still in the process of uh, considering and in building the relationship with NGOs, for instance, and setting those limits, but at the same time opportunities of cooperation, I think we'll have a better um, uh, refined approach to those issues and, and be able to, to, uh, to answer. Honestly, at this stage, I see and that's why I also see the transitional justice dimension as being something we need to take into account and, and, and feature in our work. I see every opportunity of justice as to be, uh, to be taken. Okay, so, uh, okay, good, now it's better. Uh, so let me repeat, uh, I have been advising the Polish subcommittee for reinvestigation re of the Smolensk crash of 2010. And in the process, this is a technical uh, com commission, uh, and in the process, the challenge is that the um, representatives of the perpetrators are uh, very much influencing the process of analysis and evaluation of the evidence. So uh, my question is whether your entity faces uh, political pressure, if any, in evaluating the evidence in front of you. Thank you. In evaluating and assessing the evidence we receive, I would say no. Um, but block, I mean, the, the lack of a political will to either recognize uh, the mechanism or to want to cooperate with it in 
in providing evidence in the possession of entities that have a political agenda, that is a reality. So we haven't seen what you describe in terms of an attempt to influence the assessment. The fact we are not a court also leads to the fact that we, we don't, we, we, we're not working with uh, representative of, uh, of a suspect, for instance. We are not uh, working with the lawyers of suspects. We are in the investigative phase at this stage and in the building of cases. But that I, I totally understand how, in the context you describe this, this could take place indeed in a very highly politicized environment. That's not very surprising, right? Thank you, for Thank you for being here. I have family both in Damascus and also in the villages among Syria. And from when they've come back or when I talk to them on the phone, it's very different experiences in every area. So have you found that there are different kinds of crimes that are occurring in the city compared to in more remote villages? Um, and how do you track those criminals that are moving quickly around the area? Thank you. Well, what you're saying is really uh, reflecting what I can observe, that, that really the experiences of victims uh, varies immensely uh, between one place or another, between uh, areas where uh, people in control of the area are uh, from one side or another. Um, there are things that are similar, obviously. Mm -hmm. Some of these crimes bear patterns that are similar, but they're also uh, really very different uh, um, different uh, aspects of it. And the work I was describing at the beginning uh, of my speech in terms of the, or at the middle of the speech, in terms of the effort to identify the patterns and also to reflect the specific arms that are particular to uh, certain victims is really uh, an, an important aspect of trying to, to identify that. Then you're talking about the moving of some potential perpetrators from one side or another. Well, that's also something that uh, indeed doesn't, doesn't help <laughs> the investigation or uh, the collection, even the collection of information, I would say, when, when one area becomes under the control of another uh, entity, you have a high risk of uh, losing evidence, in fact, uh, and you have a high need of preserving, finding ways, uh, even when you don't have access to yourself to the territory of Syria, which is our reality, to find ways, alternative ways to secure the, the evidence. Thank you. Okay. Um, <coughs> While using chemical warfare against a civilian population is undoubtedly a crime, uh, do you think that, that Trump uh, took the law into his own hands by dropping bombs uh, on Syria? <laughs> Listen, I, as a matter of principle, I'm not commenting on states' um, attitude <laughs> in, in this conflict. I'm looking, obviously, I, I'm not going to escape your, your question entirely, <laughs> in part only. Um, what we are looking at, obviously, when, when uh, addressing the existence, for instance, of a conflict, the nature of the conflict, uh, or conflicts, probably would be more correct in the case of Syria, or uh, assessing the existence of uh, uh, use of chemical weapons and, uh, and uh, attributing uh, responsibility to individuals for that, uh, we look at the entire dimension. So we look at conduct of states, obviously, uh, as part of uh, establishing uh, individual criminal responsibility in the cases that we look at. But as I said, I'm not making comments on individual states' uh, attitude in this complex. You will understand it's part of my my uh, obligation of independence and impartiality. Hi, thank you very much for uh, coming and speaking with us today. So lots of, or much of the success of the special court in Sierra Leone and the tribunal in Cambodia was the fact that they were able to engage with those communities directly. 
uh, especially since Damascus and Aleppo are not easily accessible. What is the mechanism doing and what is it planning to do to ensure that there is community involvement, even beyond um, any government support or not? Mm. Well, it's a very, very good question, and it's really some an area where we, we are currently putting a lot of efforts. I think, first of all, yes, recognizing that victims are not, uh, it's not a unique uh, entity. You have a variety of victims. They have different approaches to, uh, and probably um, different expectations as to what justice for them would mean. So we are attentive to that, but I, I recognize that engaging with certain categories of victims is certainly much more complicated, and particularly for victims that are, live in an area where uh, um, those who have responsibility and, and, and authority do not recognize the uh, AAAM as a valid entity. Um, that doesn't facilitate reaching out, but there are ways. I think you have uh, uh, certain uh, victims in Syria that have that are in touch with uh, um, individuals that are uh, able to travel, that are able to speak about what they uh, understand. We have a capacity to uh, reach out using um, media, including uh, radio, including TV, and it's important to not just limit, again, to uh, those who are reaching one specific audience, but trying to broaden that and make sure that we are not, uh, we are not saying something different to one audience or another. So when I'm meeting a um, representative of victims who have a particular loyalty to a certain, uh, uh, certain actors in the conflict, I'm not saying something different, in fact. And I think it's important that victims from all sides recognize that, are aware of what we can do, are aware of the limitation that we have, and can see for themselves whether they want to contribute to that effort, whether they have a willingness to, uh, to take part and to reach back out to us. Well, unfortunately, that brings us to the end of the hour. I want to... I've been too long <laughs> in my speech. I promised I would cut and I couldn't. Um, no, we, we did a wonderful job of answering a lot of questions, and we want to thank you again for your wonderful speech, your candid answers, your insights, and for coming all the way from Geneva <laughs> to uh, present to us. Um, it's really, really been a privilege for all of us. Another round of applause for our winner. Well, thank you all. There is, um, in about two weeks, a major conference in this room called International Law and Policy in the Age of Trump. We're going to uh, directly deal with the issue that the gentleman asked, so I hope you'll come back. Um, and we'll see all of you uh, soon. Thank you for coming.